Hey, I'm Stefan Papadakis with Papadakis Racing. We're here at our race shop in Carson, California, where we're building this 2020 Supra into our new drift car. We've already torn the entire car down, made a thousand horsepower with the factory engine. I'll link to those videos in the description down below. The next step is to get the engine started and then go to the dyno. Let's do that now. On this build, we are using the factory engine and a lot of the sensors, but we are replacing the entire harness of the car and putting in race grade electronics. Big part of a car build is all the electronics and the wiring harness. Because we've simplified the car so much compared to the factory, we can get away with a lot less wiring. And the wiring that we are running is what they call mil-spec wiring. It's short for military specification because a lot of the components that are used in these harnesses are used in aerospace, military vehicles, and other type of high-end equipment. The heart of the electronics is the AEM Infinity ECU that we're using. This ECU, engine control unit, is specifically designed for motorsports electronics. So it brings in all of the sensor data. It's what takes all of the information from the engine, temperatures, the boost level, the engine RPM, and then outputs it to the proper injector opening time so it gets the right amount of fuel, when to spark the coils so the spark is at the right time, and all of that is programmable on a laptop that the user can tune. And instead of the normal gauges where you might have a, a tack and temperature gauges, we use an AM AQ1 dash. The dash has all the information we would want, again, totally programmable with a laptop in one place. And nowadays, instead of having all the different temperature wires and everything coming up to the dash, it uses a protocol called CAN, C-A-N. So like this dash, it only has a power and a ground to turn it on, and then the two wires from the CAN stream, and all of the data comes in digitally through that CAN stream. Another trick part that we made for the car are all of these wiring harness tabs. The tabs are actually really simple. It's just a washer for a bolt, bent almost 90 degrees, and then tack welded onto the car. That gives a great area for the wiring harness to lay across and then for the zip tie to clamp it down. Finally, we've got Freddy down to the shop, who's the driver of the car. He's not just a great driver, he's quite technical as well. So we'll go over a few things, getting him comfortable in the car. The seat position, steering wheel, seat belts, things like that. One thing we did find is that the seat seemed to be a little bit small for him. So we went on the OMP site, found a little bit larger one, and we're gonna order that for him and install that before we get to the track. And you can imagine being away and seeing the build just like you guys are on these videos and then finally seeing it in person. He was pretty ecstatic and you could tell he's really motivated to get into the car and compete with it. And while he was here, we even put him to work. We had him putting in his own seatbelts. We had already run this engine on the engine dyno, which I'll link in the description down below if you want to see all those dynos. So we already knew that the engine would run and it should run well, but we still go through a whole process of making sure that all of the vehicle chassis harness works. So Mitch and I went through all of the inputs and outputs on the wiring schematic and made sure to test each different system that everything would turn on and there was no problems. We did find a problem where we realized we forgot to put the air temperature sensor, which normally goes in the intake pipe. We had already powder coated it, so we sanded an area of the powder coat off and then I went and welded on the bung for that air temp sensor. Once we got to a point where we were confident that everything was wired properly, we went and we put engine oil in the car and the rest of the fluids. We use a Lucas 5W50 engine oil. Once the rest of the fluids were in, I like to try to prime as much of this stuff as possible. This also helps to check for leaks. So the cooling system, we fill it up with distilled water. It doesn't have the minerals that the standard water has. Pouring the water in the rain. Damn, I gotta go pee and we found that it's less likely to have corrosion because in racing cars, typically you can't use antifreeze or coolant because if it spills on the track, it's really hard to clean up and it's slippery as well. Once it was filled with water, Aldo put on the pressure testing system, pressurized the cooling system and made sure there weren't any leaks. We then filled the fuel tank up about halfway with the E85 racing fuel that we use from Ignite and tested the fuel pumps and made sure there was no leaks in the fuel system either. Another thing we did was we pulled all of the spark plugs out of the engine and turned the engine over with the starter in order to make sure that we had oil pressure. Got 47, but we've got no change in the sink state. Okay. Once we knew that the pressure was good, then we put the plugs back in and then tried to start it. But before we got to that, we realized that the ECU wasn't seeing the right cam signal from the engine. We realized that some of the pins into the cam sensor were backwards. After we fixed that, we were able to try to start the engine. Yeah. Go ahead and, go ahead and crank it. Hold crank it. it. Fortunately, it started right away, 
and the tune-up that we used on the engine dyno worked in the car as well. Once the engine was running, we put the intercooler in and also the intercooler fan and got it ready to do a little test drive outside the shop. I did the honors of the first drive. After a little bit of testing, making sure the steering was good, the brakes felt solid and everything, I was confident all the systems worked well before we went to the dyno. After fitting the car into the trailer and getting it all strapped down, we brought it over to the chassis dyno. Yeah. Even though we've run the engine on the engine dyno, we want to run it in the car we want to make sure that the transmission, clutch, drivetrain, all that stuff works well before we go out on the test day. We're pretty fortunate that only 10 minutes away is the World Motorsports Wind Tunnel Dyno, where they work on a bunch of really high-end cars, and they have this super nice four-wheel drive dyno. We don't need the four-wheel drive side of it, but it works really well for two-wheel drive as well. We started off with some baseline runs just to make sure that the engine was cooling properly and that the base tune-up was good, and we were able to tune some part throttle stuff that we weren't able to tune on the engine dyno. Once we started doing full throttle runs, we realized the tires were spinning on the dyno. We ended up putting Sean on the back of it to get some extra weight and also to lower the tire pressure to about 12 PSI to try to get the tires to grip up as much on the rollers. If you notice the can on the passenger side of the car with the vapor coming out of it, that's the oil breather can. That's very normal for that vapor to come out, especially at high boost. We were pretty conservative at the chassis dyno. We just boosted at 25 PSI and made 750 horsepower. All that's left now is to install the body kit. Now that the car is essentially completed, I want to thank everyone that helped with it. There's a huge amount of people that have helped with this project, everything from the engine build all the way to now the chassis build and everybody that watched the videos as well. This has been a really fun project, quite stressful actually at the same time because we had such a short time period to finish it. The next time you see the car, it'll be fully dressed, ready for the track. So thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video. It's like, it's your birthday. It's Christmas morning. It's uh, first day of summer holiday, all in once. Oh my. It's happening today. All of them. Oh All of them.